and Thailand hands Sharing your commitment to help the whole world smile By your passion and intention Sharing your experience and make the whole world smile By your kindness and talent and Sharing your commitment to help the whole world smile By your passion and intention Sharing your experience and make the whole world smile By your kindness and talent and Sharing your commitment to help the whole world smile By your passion and intention Lend us a hand By your passion and intention Lend us a hand Come to join with us, I see thee Give us your hand The International College of Dentists is the oldest and largest international honour society for dentists in the world. Established in 1928, the college has more than 12,000 members in 122 countries who've been awarded the prestigious title of Fellow in the ICD. The Asia sector is expanding and we've significantly grown in the number of new members over the past year. In Section 20 Asia, there are seven categories of membership with different requirements for each of the categories. Emeritus Fellow, Master Fellow with Outstanding Contribution, Master Fellow, Honorary Fellow with Outstanding Contribution, Honorary Fellow, Fellow with Outstanding Contribution. Fellow for a member with at least five years clinical experience who has delivered significant contribution. Honorary Member. Member or elite who has served the ICD with distinction. Member or registered dentists, young dentists with less than five years clinical experience. Elite. 
non-dental profession member, student for undergraduate students. Fellowship in the college is extended by invitation only. A nominated dentist or member of the society must pass a rigorous peer review process leading to the recognition of the individual's outstanding professional achievement, meritorious service and dedication to the continued progress of dentistry for the benefit of mankind. We believe a collective effort and ideas from both dentist and non-dentist professions will contribute to a more successful collaboration, making ICD a vibrant, agile and dynamic organisation. Asia is actually one of the largest continents and with a very vast diversity in terms of cultural as well as ethnic group as well as uh, even in the language. So, uh, and there's a huge disparity in terms of income as well as the oral hygiene. What is very important at the center of my heart is that we will need to be able to give to the less developed countries. You. Okay, okay, welcome. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our weekly ITD Section 15 weekly webinar. And uh, this is the second um, uh, session for the month of October. And today uh, we have Dr. T.C. Pua. Uh, I think she is well known in Singapore for his uh, involvement in many associations. But before I introduce Dr. T.C. Pua, uh, let me, I mean, apologize for, for the last year's, uh, I mean, sorry, last, last week hiccup. Yes, last week we had one speaker uh, from Malaysia. Uh, he was unable to log in because his computer was an older version and uh, the new Zoom cannot, uh, it's not compatible. And uh, he called me the next day and he apologized for the uh, trouble, uh, the cumbersome that he has caused. And uh, he had, uh, since then, he has bought a new new laptop and he will be with us in, in the future meetings. All right. So I'm again on behalf of ICD Section 15. Um, I apologize for the hiccups last, last week. Okay. Today we have Dr. T.C. Pua. Dr. T.C. Pua graduated from National University of Singapore in 1981 with a Bachelor of Dental Surgery. He then obtained Diploma in General Dental Practice from Royal College of Surgeons of England in 1997. He's the past president of Asian Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry, president of the College of General Dental Practitioner, Singapore and vice president of the Medical Legal Society of Singapore. He's also the region of Singapore and fellow of the International College of Dentists. A dental clinician with a passion to teach and share. He has lectured on to, uh, to other practicing dentists in neighboring regions. He is in private practice with PP dental surgeons and one of the largest multidisciplinary practice in Singapore. Okay, uh, actually tonight we have more than 640, 50 registrants. Um, but so far we only have now about 265 who has logged in. Uh, but for those who log in after the 500, they can also access our program, our talk today, tonight, through YouTube Live. Okay? So, again, without further ado, I invite Dr. T. C. Pua uh, to, deliver, to deliver his, uh, uh, to share his experience with us on the topic uh, dental cement, the pairing. Okay, Dr. T. C. Pua, I think um, um, the floor is... Uh, the people are now uh, waiting to hear for your presentation. Dr. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Prof. Ibrahim. Uh, good evening, dear colleagues and uh, friends from around the region and uh, even from internationally. Um, well, as part of the uh, member in the education subcommittee of the ICD section uh, 15, uh, it is my distinct pleasure to be asked to uh, give this lecture for today. Uh, let me just share my screen and we can get this going. Right. 
Just give me a minute. Yeah, let me sort this one out. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, once again, let me thank you all for turning up this evening for the International College of Dentists Section 15 uh, webinar. Uh, like Prof say, we've been doing this series for since uh, when was that? Since the month of June, I suppose, uh, and ongoing. This is into October, and uh, I'm very pleased this evening to be asked to make this presentation. So I bring you greetings from uh, ICD section uh, 15, in particular from region 25, which is Singapore. And also I'd like to acknowledge that this uh, meeting has also been uh, supported by our College of General Dental Practitioners in Singapore. Uh, the CGDP has also been a very active group uh, in Singapore in particular in the provision of uh, continuing dental education. And that's a very dynamic group, which I'm very happy to be uh, involved together with ICD as well. So again, good evening from Singapore. Uh, for those who are not from Singapore, this is the newest site I can share with you. Uh, I took this picture myself last weekend. This is the floating Apple store at the Marina Bay Sands. Seems to be the hottest uh, thing right now that uh, especially the young ones or Apple fans are going for. And the uh, ICD Region 25, which encompasses Singapore, which I am very happy and proud to be a region. Uh, these were pictures of the fellows that were inducted uh, possibly two years ago in uh, Macau. And this is a uh, picture of the, uh, the Council of the International College of Dentists Section 15, when we were in slightly better times last year when we could meet physically. This was an event that was held in 2019 in Bangkok. And I'd like to share you this picture of my fellow colleagues, the Executive Council of the College of General Dental Practitioner, uh, where we celebrated our 20th anniversary. The college has been in existence for the last uh, 20 years. It comprises mainly of practitioners uh, who are in private practice, and we are dedicated to the furthering of excellence in clinical practice, uh, in particular in Singapore and around the region as well. And last year, uh, in celebration of our 20th anniversary of our founding, we held our big uh, fourth Asian symposium on advanced general dentistry in Singapore. Very well attended event. And uh, we hope possibly it's a biannual meeting that come uh, next year in 2021, we will have some possibility of uh, continuing this biannual meeting of ours. Right. You see picture of some food and beverages with the food. I put it this way more like a slant on something that we do uh, daily, which is pairing of materials that we are working with. And chief of which uh, is the aspect of um, getting two materials to match together. Although pairing is something that is rather important and is something that has changed a lot in recent times because of advancement. If we look into dentistry, uh, if I'm referring to that, we will find that the pairing of something that we do with all ceramics is a very interesting concept. So this evening, I thought it would be interesting if I put things the other way around. Instead of the food, I put the wine in front, which is the dental cement. So maybe we can talk about dental cements and how it relates to the all ceramics that we all like to do. There is no just one way of doing things. There are possibly several ways. And I must say this topic is something that is evolving all the time because of the R&D that continues to happen in our industry. I like to put a, a disclaimer over here at the beginning. Uh, this meeting, of course, is not sponsored by any dental manufacturer. Uh, it is an event from the International College of Dentists and supported by CGDP. Although having said that, a lot of materials that I have are really uh, my own experience from uh, using materials that I have in the office. And also at the same time, um, 
some of the information that I gather are from uh, companies that I work with in particular. And if you see uh, some of them like 3M or Ivoclar Viverden, for example, and that's because I'm more familiar with some of this material. But suffice to say, I like to put this in a very uh, objective manner of looking at material or classes of material versus the, uh, the work that we do. So here we have pictures of uh, wine on the one side and food on the other side. Let's see how in the uh, aspect of dentistry that we have, we can make any kind of semblance of pairing, all right? If we can pair some of this material in the appropriate uh, manner. So these are uh, my details, if you want to put it anyway. I'm in practice, in a group practice. And in it, of course, we have this issue of, uh, well, I have a group of 20 odd dentists coming together. And we do have varying uh, desire of liking for any particular material. And one of the things that we do is to reach a consensus in particular of what material we like to use for the appropriate indication. Uh, well, sharing you uh, slightly dated pictures of colleagues that I work with uh, in the multidisciplinary group that I am in here in Singapore, TP Dental Surgeons. And some views of the, uh, the clinic. Uh, Again, a very nice picture of ours uh, when we didn't have all this social distancing not too long ago. Uh, this was a graduating class that came to the practice uh, maybe a couple of years back. I also like to share the uh, College of General Dental Practitioners. Uh, this is a picture of my colleagues when in the month of uh, May, we mounted a team to help the uh, ministry with the training of swap operators in Singapore. And these are pictures of uh, events around this period. Colleagues of mine who are actually on the front line who volunteer their services as swap operators. And these are my college uh, colleagues uh, doing the uh, swap training. So, okay, let's get on to the, uh, the lecture at hand. So I like to anchor this pairing of uh, dental cement versus uh, all ceramics in the following manner. We talk a little bit about traditional versus resin cement. Where are we now? Because um, for the most part, we have worked very well with traditional cements for the longest time. Why is there a need for resin cement, if any at all, if there are any advantages to it? And if we have a big category of resin cements, are all of them made the same? Possibly not. Then on the other hand, we look into the, the food part of it, if you were to say about the pairing, which is the indirect tooth colored restoration. There has been an explosion, uh, literally, in a sense that uh, there's a huge demand for tooth colored restoration to be placed as a restorative material. And what are some of the choices that we have as tooth colored restorations? And perhaps then we can look into the appropriate pairing. And finally, of course, the correct fit of the dental cement to these indirect restorations. So let's talk about the wine aspect of it, which is the uh, resin cement. Well, what is cementation? Well, essentially, of course, cementation is the seating of uh, prosthetic restoration, be it uh, veneers, inlays, crowns, uh, partial crowns or onlays, uh, bridges onto natural teeth or implant abutments. And in the past, we were putting things like porcelain fused metal crown or full metal crowns. And the choice of material essentially were traditional dental cement, which namely were zinc phosphate in the first part. And maybe sometime in the 70s came glass ionoma in, uh, in the fashion that we have. And these are representative brands that we may want to look at. And conventional cement, be it zinc phosphate, glass ionoma, or the later resin modified glass ionoma, as represented by some of these representative brands here, we have some Shofu zinc phosphate, there's Fuji 1 from GC, this is uh, Relay X uh, Luting 2, which is actually a resin modified glass ionoma formulation. Uh, for all ceramic restoration, we will need it for polycrystalline ceramics. Essentially, it's the cornea. 
or the stronger lithium desilicate glass ceramics that can uh, take this kind of cementation as long as the color doesn't impact it. We need this restoration to have retentive preparation as well. And of course, because of the color of these cement, they are not suitable for highly translucent all ceramics. If you have, uh, say, a very translucent Emax crown, for example, that's not, uh, that's not the appropriate uh, material to use. So conventional cementation works essentially to fill the space and the friction creates mechanical retention. So it's a bricks and mortar type of situation where you're filling in the space. And retentive preparation is very much required. If you remember our time in dental school, uh, the preparation should have a taper of anything from four degrees to eight degrees. You find that if you go beyond eight degrees, the amount of uh, retention drops off remarkably. You need to have a core height of four millimeters to resist the uh, loss of retention. And from the early studies of Jorgensen, you find that these studies show that anywhere somewhere beyond eight degrees, you find the rate of retention drops down remarkably. So that's retentive preparation for us. And if we look at it in a, a clinical picture like this, we're looking at a crown preparation height of four millimeters or more and a divergence no more than eight degrees. Then come this different animal of resin cements. And it became very popular sometime uh, pushing on into the 80s and 90s. And it's a big class of cement. And what I, I want to do this evening for me as a consumer, as a practicing dentist, is to make some sense as to how do these cements work or are all resin cements made similarly? Are they all the same? Uh, in no particular order, but maybe from the manufacturers, from say the Ivocla Vividen Stable, they have cement like Multilink N, they have Verulink N. Uh, well, different markets were different. They even have cements like uh, 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 what they call uh, Verulink Aesthetics. They have uh, Multilink Speed. 3M has material like uh, Relight X Ultimate. They have Relay X veneer cement, and they have the highly popular Unisem, uh, Relay X Unisem. So are these materials the same and how do they react? Because ultimately resin cement is based upon a BIS-GMA formulation, and they have uh, an inherent advantage over traditional cement because of bonding. And going down the line, you see from Kerr, you have uh, Nexus Universal, NX3, and they have uh, Maxam Elite. Now you find that the universal cement needs some kind of uh, uh, adhesion, and this is self-etching in the cement itself. Then you have the traditional Panavia. Bisco, we have a Dueling Universal. Choice 2, which is very much meant for veneer cement. Is, are these cement any similar or dissimilar, even though they're resin cement? They have Terrasem, they have Bissem, right? And then over here, I think we have uh, Calibra from Densply. So essentially, I'd like to state uh, my idea of uh, cement as far as resin is concerned. On the one hand, we have uh, conventional cement, which is spoke about. As far as resin cement, there are two categories of resin cement. And that is aesthetic resin cement, which is essentially light cure or dual cure, and universal resin cement, the ones that are self-cure with a light cure option. So there are two big categories that, that we have out here. So the aesthetic resin cement fall in this category of light cure possibility. The universal resin cement are mostly self-cure or chemical cure. They have a dual cure function, but essentially these cement can cure in the dark. And you differentiate resin cement based upon their ability to mostly light cure or the ability to mostly self-cure. So aesthetic and universal resin cement. So as an example, if you were to draw a line over here between light cure and self-cure, you find this kind of representation coming up. 
that we have cements like uh, Calibra veneer, uh, cements like the Relay X uh, veneer cement. We have Choice 2 from Bisco or Verilink N as the cement that are essentially going to be meant for light curing. And we're talking about cementation of very translucent type of restoration like veneers versus cement on the other hand, which are self-cure with a light cure option like the uh, Unisem, the Panavia cement, Multilink N and Bissem. Okay, let's see if we make some uh, distinction between the two. So aesthetic resin cement as represented by these uh, clinical example here has some of them like the Verilink N throws in a catalyst, but essentially you're looking at a cement that can as its base by itself be cured by light alone. Universal resin cement typically are self-cure. It comes as a paste and paste, a base and catalyst mix, all right? Uh, the original kit on the block was actually Panavia that's been uh, there for the longest time. And then we have the Multilink N and the other cement that came uh, into play. Uh, let me move this. One minute, I seem to be frozen here. Okay, here we go. So the light cured cement, material choices can be represented by Verilink Aesthetic. Verilink N from Ivoclaw Viverden. Uh, by no means is this list uh, exhaustive. Relay X Veneer Cement from 3M SP, Calibra by Densply. These are typically cement that are meant for translucent ceramics that you can light cure in itself without the use of a catalyst. The reason being is that when you put catalyst into a, a resin formulation, we do run a chance that we incorporate tertiary amine. And if we work with tertiary amine, there's a good possibility with due time that you get discoloration. And so the biggest concern that we have is shade change on a cementation uh, situation uh, left over time. So these cements are made to be amine free or at least very low in tertiary amine. All right, so here we have, uh, well, on a lot of companies, they usually make two range of products for different market. Uh, I know that Ivocla has an N market and this is the regular market. So what you see here is a Verilink aesthetic. And uh, what it is over here is that we have manufacturers who uses a lot of idea of a value shape concept. Instead of making cement of any particular color, uh, they are putting it in terms of value. If you have a transparent or neutral cement at medium value zero, and then you have plus one, plus two, plus three to make it cooler or, or, or going up that way in terms towards the white, and this goes towards the yellow or the warmer or lower value, this is how you work your way into the equation. The high value shades enable a gradual, gradual brightening of it, and conversely, the low value shades provide a gradual warming effect to the final restoration. In fact, the concept is not uh, too, too uh, new really. It was originally done by 3M in the Opal cement. Uh, here we have uh, resin cements that are dual cure. Essentially, we're looking at the universal cement uh, this is where the market has a big explosion of cement out there. We have Panavia V5 from Curare, uh, Multilink Automix or Multilink N from Ibocla Viverden, Relay X Ultimate uh, 3M SP. This is a cement that 3M is starting out that you can use either as a self cure, total edge, or selective edge. Okay. And uh, this product comes from Shofu, Resi Cement. Okay, from Shofu. Resisem, sorry. And there's another category, which is a subset of universal resin cement, and that is the all-in-one type resin cement. It was made popular by the uh, Rila X Unisem or the U200 when they first, uh, when they first had this uh, cement coming in. And that was where you incorporate the bonding steps all together in the cement. That means one size fits all, one cement fits all. So 
this cement goes into the uh, restorative surface of the, um, of the crown and you do not have a separate step like if I were to go back, uh, 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 the cement over here. Let me see if I can go back. No, apparently I can't. Just give me a minute. Huh? I don't seem to be moving this. Anyway, suffice to say, these examples of cement are the ones that are for dentists who like to cement typically uh, restorations like zirconia, but do not want to go through the extra step of making an extra bonding step for the tooth itself. So it's uh, all in one inside the cement. All right, so made popular by the Unisem or U200. Uh, Kerr has Maxem and Ibuclub Ibudin has uh, Multilink Speed. So what do we talk about traditional versus resin cement? So what, what we have uh, in distinction over here is that we have traditional cements like zinc phosphate and glass ionomer or resin modified glass ionomer that we have worked for the longest time. A lot of these are acid-based reaction. And, and this material works very well with the traditional material that we have. And for the longest time, we've been working with metal crowns or phosphine fused to metal crown. And that's how these cements work. Pretty much like a space filler and a friction created as a mortar and pestle type of cement. The resin cement came about because of the need to retain better, to adhere something better. And resin cements come in various forms. Some of them do have priorities of trying to cement something that is in the dark, like an inlay, onlay, or a crown of certain thickness. Some are made for the ability to have no amine, particularly cementation of veneers. And these cements are meant for translucent type of porcelain. All right, so the manner which you bond and the manner which you can do all in one do distinguish this resin cement. But the line is blurring because the, the e R&D is coming fast and furious. But suffice to say, this is what we understand at this point in time. Now that we have dealt with the wine portion of it, let me talk about the food portion of it, which is the indirect tooth colored restoration. What do we have in terms of uh, choices as far as indirect tooth colored restoration? Well, ceramic is still the material of choice of laboratory fabricated aesthetic restoration. We do also know the dentists are relying more on the expertise of the laboratory technician as a result of using newer materials like this, even more so. Modern dental ceramics have proliferated, resulting in more choices of uh, clinical indication uh, or patient's requests. And the drive towards aesthetic is promoting metal-free ceramics. So we have choices. Right, We all have choices to make and sometimes these choices are affected very much by marketing and advertisement. So as any dental consumer or consumer for that matter, and I, I put two pictures over here, one for the ladies and the other one for the guys. Uh, well, the ladies have your shoes and the guys have all the beers. What do we choose and why do we want to choose in the particular objective that we like to achieve? Excuse me, something been moving. Yeah, there you go. So we all have decisions to make as far as uh, restorative material to choose, even in the all ceramics arena. Some of these can be ceramics. It can be also uh, zirconia, which is actually polycrystalline. It can be like Lava Ultimate is essentially a resin. Then we can have choices between different kinds of restoration. This is a Maryland bridge, an inlay or onlay, we like to call it, traditional crowns or veneers for the example. So it impacts us as how we choose this material. So these are the two categories as far as I see it for indirect tooth colored restoration. It can either be ceramics or indirect resin. And it can be on a framework or it can be something that is framework free. Okay, 
that was ceramics. And these are examples of uh, the newer uh, materials of the uh, arena like uh, zirconias. We also have the resin material, okay? If we talk about ceramics over here, we have the traditional felt spa, which is the Vita. We also have newer uh, different materials like lisi, for example, lithium, lithium desilicate, because Emax is not the only material that is uh, lithium desilicate infiltrated. As far as porcelain range is concerned, we have been used to porcelain fuse the metal crown for the longest time. And along the way, we had mod uh, modification of it like the CapTech crowns. Excuse me, we'll advance this. Okay. When the all ceramics came, we had the Empress aesthetic veneer. We also had the press material or the CAT CAM material in various forms. And some of the earliest were the Emax Press or CAT. Uh, I'm using primarily over here the uh, Emax range because it's the uh, very popular material that everybody is familiar with. But Emax is just a family name. We have Emax CAT, which is uh, essentially a lithium desilicate type of material, glass infiltrated. When we have Emax Zircat, this is a zirconia material. The very first ones that came up were very monolithic and very opaque ones, uh, tetragonal face, and they could be layered, and they probably have to be layered with uh, feldspathic porcelain to get aesthetics. So it is a core material. And then the newer materials like lava, this was uh, a version like uh, Zircon or the Emax Zircat. And then we had Lava Plus, and you see over here was primarily meant for zirconia to approach the possibility of the glass ceramic to make it more translucent. So you hear a lot of translucent ceramics, but it's a trade-off over there which I would like to touch on uh, shortly. So what are dental ceramics? Essentially, dental ceramics are feldspathic glasses or silicon dioxide with added metal oxide. And they all acts like glass and the presence of surface cracks causes failures of this material. Modern strengthened dental ceramics was developed through a variety of methods in terms of uh, crystals added on to prevent these cracks from happening. Here you see uh, a schematic diagram over here where if you look under the microscope, you see the surface of a ceramic crown, it has flaws. In fact, there are names for it. Physically, they're called Griffith's flaws. And the way these things fail is that if you load on them, there's crack propagation and that's how it fails. And materials like Empress and Emax or the early ones like Dicor were the first to infiltrate all these glass ceramics with crystals, all right? With crystals of aluminous oxide or later with, uh, with a leucide or lithium desilicate. The whole idea is to resist the propagation of crack. Hence, you get a stronger glass ceramics. Excuse me. Apologize, I do seem to have a little bit of lag on this computer. And the history of dental porcelain, Pierre Fouchard was the first to mention about artificial teeth on tin gold plate. C.H. Land did the first or made the first porcelain jacket crown with a platinum matrix back in uh, 1887. And this is the advent of where we have porcelain fused the metal crown. Uh, Dr. Weinstein uh, in Los Angeles did the first uh, porcelain fused the metal crown in 1962, whereby it uses a framework of uh, metal alloy, gold alloy, and porcelain is bonded onto it or adhered onto it. McLean in England did the first aluminous porcelain all ceramic crown in 1965, and the first glass ceramic infiltrated crown, die cork, came into the market. And later, IPS Empress from Ivor Claude River then came on to using the lost wax technique. 
like what we were doing with metal. And if you look at a cross section of a diagram of a veneer or tooth preparation, you see a very interesting sandwich of chemistry over here. On the one hand, we have um, porcelain, and on the other hand, we have the tooth substrate. We know that the tooth is pretty much a very uh, wet environment or uh, lots of water in it, whereas the um, porcelain is pretty phobic to water. How do we make this surface, which is hydrophobic, to a tooth material, which is essentially a hydrophilic material and joined together. And that's where the understanding of the use of silane and adhesive that will help us adhere onto the resin cement and the resin cement adhering onto the edge uh, porcelain surface. So this came with the concept of uh, bonding. As far as dental bonding is concerned, uh, 1955, Bionokov published the first paper on uh, treating acid onto enamel. And at that point in time, it wasn't actually all that new because what it actually says is that uh, like the manufacturers in the car industry, if you were to put acid onto uh, metal, it helps the paint adhere better. So what we're creating is micro uh, porosity or bonding roughness onto it upon which we can adhere our, our resin. I apologize for the slow speed of this computer advancement of slide. Yeah, here we go. So as far as um, going forward on the restorative, the resin side, Waller in 1973 did the first polymerization with light, first using ultraviolet light. In 1982, Dart Enamic patented a composite that hardened with blue light. And this is the key uh, paper that came up in 1983. Simonson and Kalamia uh, published a paper on technique to bond composite resin to porcelain. And that is the advent of uh, porcelain laminate veneers. So in the current modern context, all ceramic restorations refer to metal-free restoration. And the best uh, publication I can point you to is the All Ceramics at a Glance, published by the Society for Dental Ceramics out in Europe under a chap called uh, Dr. Kunzelman. In that uh, publication, it seeks to define all ceramic system into two big categories of the glass ceramics on one hand, with somewhere in between the infiltrated glass, and on the other extreme, the oxide ceramics or the zirconia ceramics, okay? So the glass ceramics, if you look down the line, uh, people like felspatic ceramics or glass ceramics, like the, the uh, Empress and the Emax Press and Cat. The glass infiltrated were the in ceram that came, not as popular now. And the new kit on the block were the oxide ceramics, where there were not so much ceramics, but polycrystalline situation. And that's where we are talking about the uh, zirconias. So there are three main uh, division, as we see. We have predominantly glassy material on the one hand and polycrystalline or zirconia type material on the other hand. From the uh, Kelly publication, it came a few conclusions that highly aesthetic ceramics are predominantly glassy and higher strength structure ceramics are generally crystalline. So this is considered weaker and this is considered stronger ceramics. And development of uh, substructure ceramics involve an increase in crystalline content to the polycrystalline phase that we are in with the zirconias. Okay, so the same diagram again. So on this side is glassy material. On the other hand, we're looking at polycrystalline material. Well, we all have this situation in our clinic for sure. We see a patient with obviously two porcelain fused to metal crown. And we can see the very huge opacity that we see over here versus the ability to look like teeth, which are polychromatic. These 
are highly opaque with a very discernible creamy look at this. And uh, if you look in a higher view, you can see that this does not approach anywhere close to what natural enamel gives us. Another closer view. But if you look closely on the neighboring tooth over here, and I flip it over on the palatal side, we're actually looking at an all ceramics crown versus what was here just now. This tooth is actually not enamel, but all ceramics. In this case, it's a uh, empress crown. And therefore, we can now discern that this particular crown, because of its optical property, approaches to what would look like in natural tooth. And this is the advent of all ceramics as we have right now. So this is a good case, I thought, to illustrate the fact between old and new, between traditional porcelain fused to metal and an all ceramic crown. And the differential is very basically based upon light path characteristic. You see, if you have a diagram of a natural tooth and if light strikes the tooth, there are certain reactions to it. Some of the lights get reflected some of them get refracted and some of them get transmitted. If you have an opaque core, like a porcelain fused to metal crown or one of the traditional zirconia crown, which is very opaque, the light characteristic for the most part where it hits the core is mostly reflected back. And this light characteristic does not come close to the light characteristic of a natural tooth. If you put a translucent crown which is where the all ceramics, like the uh, infiltrated glass ceramics, like the Emax, the DC, uh, Sarah, you will find that the light characteristic that you have in terms of reflection, refraction, and transmission approaches closest to a natural tube. So the rationale of making an all ceramics in this instance is primarily due to aesthetics or the drive for aesthetics. I apologize again. Probably I'm having too much slides on here that is hanging. Here we go. And if you look at the refractive index, <clears throat> excuse me, the chart of the refractive index we have between vacuum and zirconia, with all the materials in between, you will quickly discern that feldspar, emax, dentine, and enamel have refractive index that are very similar. And substrate translucency is a critical factor in matching the aesthetics of natural teeth. <clears throat> Excuse me. So another case that um, it's been quite old already, but suffice to say is a very classically good case to show as an example, porcelain fused cemento crown, all right? With this particular patient, um, everything else is okay, but aesthetics is not as good as we like it to be. And there was a request by the patient to uh, improve upon it. You take the pair of crowns off. Fortunately, the uh, tooth were fairly even in coloration, all right? And in this instance, a pair of Emax press crowns were made and appropriately cemented with the appropriate resin cement, all right? In this instance, we use a universal resin cement that has a separate bonding step. And the uh, ability to mimic tooth structure in terms of having a translucent core material like uh, uh, Emax crown will be distinctly more advantageous than the original porcelain fused to metal crown. So comes the concept of etching and bonding. Glassy and particle fused ceramics can predictably be etched for micromechanical bonding. And that's where glass, glass can be like enamel with calcium selectively be etched, but we can't use uh, phosphoric acid. We're gonna use hydrofluoric acid, all right? Like in here, 
Here we have a, a couple of uh, porcelain laminate veneers and we're using uh, porcelain ash. This one is from Ultraden. And you get that kind of typical uh, edge pattern in the glass fitting surface of your, of your uh, infiltrated glass ceramics. And you need to improve the surface tension or traction to resin. And that's where we use a silane material, right? Any of the brand that it is, if you're using Ivoclar, they have a material called Monobond N. So you see the conditioning of uh, glass ceramics as it happened between unetched glass ceramic and you etch it with uh, hydrofluoric acid, it increases micro retentive surface and increases the uh, reactive surface or surface tension. And upon that ceramic restoration, you have to treat it. And this instance that you're making a wetting agent to get a silane onto it. And these are representation of silane on the market. We have 3M Aspey, uh, we have Bisco material, and this is from Kurari, I think. And this is uh, from Outreden. Um, an interesting concept which uh, colleagues have not heard of before is a silane material that makes it into two in one. Because the problem with dealing with hydrofluoric acid is that it is a fairly strong and very caustic material, potentially poisonous. And sometimes it messes up with your porcelain sink and a lot of other things. And this is an, uh, an attempt to make a monobond etch and prime. That means you put the, uh, well, a version of the hydrofluoric acid together with the silane. So all in one is work simplification in a single bottle. So the single component ceramic etch and uh, silenate the glass ceramics at the same time. So we just put this into the, uh, into the fitting surface of your crown and you wash that and that in itself will silenate the material in just one single step. So if we talk about zirconia type of material, we do know they are polycrystalline, there's no glass in it. So the way we improve the uh, bonding or the adhesion is to treat it differently. So we can't use the hydrofluoric acid because there's no glass to it. And the manner which we are gonna to try to get some kind of adhesion between uh, zirconia and between glass ceramic is quite different. So these are some of the uh, summary on the uh, ceramics that we've spoken so far, the old ceramics. If we are talking in, I uh, apologize, so I'm gonna use the Ivoclar Viverden range because that's the one that I'm most familiar with. If you use that range of either a leucite infiltrated glass ceramics or one of these uh, lithium desilicate formulation, the IPS Empress is considered at 160 megapascal a lower strength ceramic. Whereas the uh, Emax press and uh, the other Emax material at 400 megapascals are the highest strength material. So the glassy ceramics can be predictably etched for micro-mechanical bonding. So if you're going to cement for the uh, lower strength infiltrated glass ceramic, you would like to have it as a bonded resin cement. And if you have these slightly higher strength ceramics, like the Emax uh, Press or Emax Cat, uh, you have the possibility of even using conventional cementation. Yeah. And here we have the zirconias. Okay, I'm just using the Emax Zircat as an example, polycrystalline. 900 megapascal or even more than that, they are relatively strong as an as a in vitro material, but in itself, you need to layer it with ceramics because they're very opaque with very little uh, uh, micro mechanical retention. And if you you can use conventional cementation to it, but one would need retentive preparation. Remember we spoke about the eight degrees and the four millimeter, eight degree taper and the four uh, millimeters crown height. And it is advisable that uh, zirconia be pre-treated with air abrasive uh, type of technique. 
And the zirconia primer is used to enhance the bond with resin cement. So alternative approach to zirconia surface prep, if you do not have the ability to uh, air abrade, is to use some kind of a dental soap, for example, because what happens is that when you try in all these zirconia crowns, it gets contaminated with blood and saliva. And there are two distinctly new material on the market here, Ivoclean for Ivoclavividin, Zerclean from Bisco. And what it does is like a dental soap, all right? that you can apply into the fitting surfaces of your teeth, wash that off, and that will give you a very clean surface for you to prime your zirconia, all right? Remember for zirconia surfaces, never, never clean it with uh, phosphoric acid because that poisons the surface and you will not be able to put the zirconia primer, which essentially has MDP in it, all right? Because it will block all the sites for the MDP to bond onto. So zirconia porcelain, in summary, if they are monolithic, they are oftentimes going to be layered by uh, some form of glass ceramics for aesthetics. They are monolithic in itself. You're going to use it for posterior teeth where aesthetics or translucency is not highly uh, required. And the commercial examples are like Emax Zircat Whalen from Ivoclaw Viverden, Sircon from Densply, Lava from 3M Esprit, Procera from Nobel Biochem, Procera Zirconia rather. Now come a new entity that has gone to the market. It's not all that new, although when I, I first put it, it was fairly new, and that is translucent zirconia, right? Translucent zirconia is an attempt by manufacturers to try and design material in the zirconia range that has the uh, advantage of zirconia, but the aesthetics of a translucent glass ceramics like the Emax lithium desilicate, all right? So it's represented by things like um, uh, we have from Katana, we come from 3M, the Lava Plus. Katana, Zirconia, you can see uh, for the most part, these uh, material are a lot more um, translucent, all right? And you can find the translucency perimeter between Katana HT versus the Ultra uh, Translucent. These are more translucent. The, uh, the uh, gold standard, if anything, is the traditional high translucent Emax uh, ingot, for example. Right, enamel being translucency at one um, 13.7, 18.7, please excuse me. So these uh, translucent zirconia can work as a monolithic uh, zirconia or layered zirconia, but suffice to say, we need to know that these zirconias are not as strong as the traditional uh, tetragonal zirconia. So there's a trade-off in porcelain strength. So you still need to make sure you bond them very well. The commercial example are Xenostar Pure, Valen, Zircon HT, Lava Plus, Ice Zirconia Translucent from Zircon Zan. So the flexural strength of Zirconia, as you can see, the highly translucent Katana HT uh, is stronger at 1,200 megapascal versus the newer ultra translucent ones at uh, 800 megapascal, 600 megapascal, excuse me. And Emax is at 400, but understanding that Emax can be bonded. So we're not comparing apples and apples over here, whereas you can still bond, but the bond strength is never going to approach anything like the infiltrated glass ceramics. So as a, as a matter of indication, when you're talking about zirconia, uh, I wouldn't recommend making zirconia veneer because the bonding is not predictable enough and I don't see any advantage in trying to get translucency from zirconia in vis-a-vis uh, -vis for, for veneer type restoration. So zirconias are probably better off making in crowns. Uh, in anterior crown, you would love to layer them. If you can't get the aesthetics, you have to put some glass ceramic. For serial crown, we can use it as monolithic three unit bridges and long span bridges, of course. So notes for all uh, ceramic crown that are made of zirconia. Um, hydrofluoric acid and silane will not etch or bond zirconia. Opaque zirconia is still stronger and we use it when conservative preparation is needed. Translucent zirconia is translucent but certainly weaker than the original opaque zirconia. But watch this space because the brands are evolving very quickly. 
So let's talk a little bit about indirect resin uh, before we make some conclusion on material recommendation. Uh, this is something that has come into favor again because of the advantage of resin. Um, Lava Ultimate is a highly popular material. We have Ceramish from Shofu. Uh, we have Nexco from uh, Ivo Club Viverden. And this other material I can't recollect now. Okay, so the need for indirect resin uh, composite compared to direct CR compared to ceramics. There's polymerization shrinkage advantage in uh, making a resin indirectly in the lab. There is higher polymerization conversion, so you get a stronger material in the indirect resin formulation. There's more wear resistant compared to uh, direct CR versus uh, the indirect lab fabricated CR. In comparison to uh, ceramics, there is greater absorption of compressing loading force, all right? So it is something that uh, we would love it against implant, for example. It has less wear to opposing enamel compared to glass ceramics. Less marginal chipping as well. So here we have uh, some representation, as I say, Nexco, Lava Ultimate, Ceramic, uh, Ceramage, sorry. So the structure and composition essentially a microhybrid type of composite. The polymer polymerization techniques can be light cure plus heat, vacuum or pressure. Surface treatment is oftentimes with sandblasting, aluminum oxide, silane. It's contraindicated for uh, hydrofluoric uh, acid uh, etching because there's not much glass in it. Again, I apologize, I'm not. Just give me a minute. So here I have a table of some of the uh, common brand that we have right now in terms of indirect resin composites. We have Block HC from Shofu, Sarah Smart from GC, Lava Ultimate from 3M Aspe, Vita Enamic from Vita. And as you can see, the materials are CAT CAM composite resin. This is a hybrid ceramic. And the other uh, technical information, if you're interested, you can take a screenshot of that. Just give me a minute. I do apologize. I haven't encountered this before on this computer. So indications for indirect resin composite, one can make it for inlays and onlays. And it is excellent as an implant supported crown material. So that is that much about talking about indirect resin material. We have a huge category down there. Uh, so ceramics in itself can be very different in sense of glass ceramics and polycrystalline ceramics on one hand. And on the other hand, we have the, uh, the uh, indirect resin material. So let me finish by trying to put a pairing of wine and food together and we hope we can have a uh, classical good end to a meal. So as, as you see, there's no just one way of doing it. There's probably some ways that are not advisable. We understand the uh, resin cement that we have spoken so far. So a lot of it depends on these three variables between the restoration type that we've chosen, meaning the, uh, the uh, type of material, be it an inlay, which is somewhat different from a veneer, for example, or certainly different from a crown. So the question we need to answer is, 
what is the type of restoration? Are you working all ceramics on a veneer or are you working all ceramics on a long span bridge? Are you working on a tooth substrate or are you working on an implant substrate? All right, because the characteristic of tooth and implant titanium is somewhat different. And the other question on restorative type is also moisture control, which is probably one of the most important thing that uh, uh, we should be aware of if we're gonna use resin cement in particular. And we need to be aware of the location of the margin. It's definitely not an issue if it's equigingival or supra gingival, but what if you have a sub gingival margin? All right, what kind of uh, uh, cement would you be comfortable with? The other variable relates to tooth colored material. And here we have a revision of what I have said earlier, and I'll finish this lecture, in that if you're treating glass ceramic, we can selectively etch it, not with phosphoric acid, but with hydrofluoric acid. And the uh, attempt over here is to create microporosity or retention for us to insert uh, a silane type material to improve upon the uh, wettability of this material. Okay, again, apologize, I've hung again. this. Although you're done in our Zoom meeting, this is the first one where you see the slide doesn't want to advance. Appreciate your patience. Yes. I'm right at the end, Prof. So let me just get this thing to move. Yep, there you go. So if you have selectively removed the glass, you need to silenate it with a wetting bond, uh, like a bonding onto the uh, ceramic. A sardine. When we work with zirconia ceramics, as we talked just now, cleaning improved the uh, bond strength of zirconia restoration, assuming uh, resin cement is used. And the cleaning for zirconia is aluminum sand blasting at a specific uh, two bar pressure. So we're not using very aggressive uh, 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 sand blasting over here. And you use the possibility of a dedicated soap material like Ivoclean or Zerclean from Bisco. And you create micro mechanical retention and then you prime them. And the primers that you have are all the uh, MDP type material as you have from Clearfield over here. Monobond N has silane, it also has the MDP inside here. And you have the Z prime from Bisco, ceramic primer from uh, GC. So here's my summary slide and we can, uh, we can uh, make sense of the pairing. So again, I'm, I, I'm gonna use the Ivo Club dividend because that's the one that has a representative of all the glass ceramics that we have. IPS Empress, the original one, which was a uh, leucite reinforced ceramic of low strength, 140 to 160 megapascal and See, it seems to work best if I exit and start again. Yeah, it works better here. So your choice one is to have adhesive cementation, all right? Uh, so you really can have a choice of using a cement like uh, Veriling N or Veriling Aesthetic. You could also use one of the newer cement like Relight X Ultimate from 3M Aspect. You have choice number two, you can have adhesive cementation. 
That means you're not using the aesthetic resin, but you're using the universal resin cement. And one of the example out there is Multilink N. Or you can use the uh, Relight X Ultimate. If you have the stronger field glass ceramics like the Emax Press, remember the other one was uh, was uh, Empress. If you use uh, Emax Press, which is a lithium to silicate material, you have more choices because in itself is a stronger ceramics. You can use both either, sorry, adhesive or conventional cementation. Adhesive cementation, one can use universal resin cement like the Multilink N or the aesthetic resin cement, if you so choose to use like the uh, Verilink N or the Verilink Aesthetic. And you can also use the, uh, the Speed Cement, which is the all-in-one, uh, pretty much like the Unisem type material. And of course, you know, if you use a conventional cement, can be zinc phosphate or resin modified glass iron. And the last one, which is the popular zirconia crown, all right? Typically, uh, zirconia because they are stronger. One can also use adhesive or conventional cementation, all right? You can use universal resin like the Multilink N or the uh, Panavia. Uh, V5 or Panavia F, you could use BISSEM as I've showed just now, or you could use Multilink Speed, all right? Multilink Speed or the Unisem material. And of course, these strong core material can certainly use conventional cement like zinc phosphate or resin modified glass item. Okay, so I, I hope uh, it's a laborious exercise to try and understand or pair between dental cements, which has uh, been out there uh, and increasingly getting complex because everybody's coming with new brands or modification of existing brand. But suffice to say, um, if we're talking about newer dental cements like the resin cement, to me as a practitioner, I just need to know uh, whether that resin cement is meant for universal use or aesthetic use, all right? Aesthetic cements are very specific uh, if I'm working with appearance related like veneers, for example, I would be very keen to use a cement that doesn't have amine in there, or at least the manufacturers tell me it's very amine reduced and there's no color shift. And for the most part, I'm very interested in just light cure type of cementation. The universal cement, the resin cement that are universal, are meant for the workhorse. That in it, I can cement my crowns, I can cement my inlays or onlays, that's something that is in the dark. It can cure on its own by chemical cure alone, all right? So these cements also, by the way, have the possibility of being all in one as represented by the original cement that made it very popular like the Unisem. Uh, but the trade-off when you use something that is all in one, we would understand that the bonding capability or the bond strength is lower than a dedicated bonding uh, universal resin cement where the adhesion step is separately on the tooth itself and the cement is on the fitting surface of the treated uh, uh, crown surface or the restorative surface. So that kind of cement uh, makes the best bond strength for those uh, material that we're talking about. So these are my final thoughts as it is in terms of how we pair them because ultimately uh, whatever we choose is for the kind of indications that we're doing and the, the type of practice that you run and the manner which you're going to train your staff to use this. Right, so I've reached to the end and I'd like to uh, give grateful thanks to the organization of the International College of Dentists for uh, participants here who are not uh, members of the ICD. You will know that it's one of the oldest honor, it is the oldest dental honor society. And uh, in there we have uh, colleagues who are experienced and who are accorded that honor for the level of experience that they are in. And I'd like to put special mention for my group of guys, the College of General Dental Practitioners, which I've been passionate for the last 20 years. And this is the uh, picture of my current uh, executive uh, council of the College of General Dental Practitioners, Singapore. 
And last but not least, I need to uh, pay credit to the guys I work with in the practice. And these are pictures of my colleague in uh, my practice in TP Dental. And I'd like to uh, put a plug for CGDP. We, uh, we have a Facebook uh, group called the CGDP Forum that we would love for dental colleagues to come on board and join in because it is a sharing forum. And in it, we are trying to put on uh, things of topical interest, for example. And we have a big group of people who are dentists in there and we share cases and position situation that we uh, sometimes we put advisories for, for dental practice as well. So I end with a uh, uh, request for any questions that uh, may arise from the lecture today. Thank you, TC, for uh, sharing with us your, um, your thoughts about pairing of cements and uh, the veneer and all that. I think uh, there are several questions you can see in the chat room. Uh, okay, um, if we want to tackle the phone, I think maybe we can start from the bottom and go up. And we see about kind of, uh, the first question is from, I don't know, from zero. <laughs> What material would you recommend for inlay and onlay zirconia or emax? Well, interesting question. I think you need to go back to, uh, for that matter, even material choice. If you have uh, inlay and um, you have retentive uh, features on it, you could use zirconia, but really the material of choice for inlays and onlays should be some form of bondable ceramics, be it uh, in this case, um, Emax or DC material. And if you're going to use a uh, infiltrated glass ceramics like the DC material, then I would say the material, uh, uh, the cement of choice would be one of these universal resin cement that can cure in the dark. Typically, it's something like Multilink N, Panavia. Uh, I would probably look into using something like um, Bissam. Maxam from Kerr. These are some of the materials that are essentially dual cure, but chemical cure in itself. All right. But if you're going to use the glass ceramic, then the treating of the surface will be very important. You will have to have hydrofluoric acid etching on it. Uh, sometimes it's done in the lab, or you prefer, you can do it in your office and you have to silenate it. Okay. So that, that would be my cement of choice. Okay. Thank you. I think the next question is, um, from Yuan Kuo, uh, can 3M Rely X 200 be used in veneers? Three, well, Rely X is, uh, is a generic name. It's like the surname for, for uh, all the 3M resin cement, or for that matter, even the mod, uh, resin modified glass animal. Sometimes it can be very confusing. So when you say Rely X uh, cement, did, did, the, did the question say a particular Rely X cement? Did you notice it? No, no just 3M Rely X 200. Oh, Rely X 200. Okay, I, I get it. So this is the all-in-one cement. If you look into indication, I suspect you will see that they will not recommend it for veneers. Reason being is that if I'm working with uh, uh, ceramic veneers, I have a distinct situation where the veneer is going to be totally anchored onto my tooth by adhesion. I don't have that much mechanical retention. So this is one example. I would like to use maximum bond strength. And we know some of these universal all-in-one resin cement don't have the highest bond strength. They have, they have the highest convenience for us to use. So it's one of those cement you can use like you're using a zinc phosphate cement. You just put everything onto the tooth itself or the veneer, or if you think you want to use it, you shouldn't be doing a veneer, say a crown, and you cement it onto the tooth without any, any bonding step on the tooth. So um, in this particular instance, I would say use a aesthetic resin cement, a cement that is going to be like cure since the uh, veneer that you're doing is going to be a fairly translucent type of uh, ceramics that the light can penetrate. And therefore, I will have no issue of using uh, cement that is totally light cure for the most part without any catalyst at all. Because in the catalyst, oftentimes, is tertiary amine. And tertiary amine, we know over time, may have a concern with discoloration. And with veneer, 
if my cement were to discolor underneath my veneer, it will probably have an impact on the color or shade of my uh, final result. So if you want your Relight X uh, brand over here, then I would say you might want to use the Relight X veneer cement, a dedicated Relight X veneer cement, which is an aesthetic resin cement meant for cementing veneer, all right? But it's totally light cure. You will still have, uh, I presume your veneer is made of a uh, infiltrated glass ceramic like uh, Emex Cat or Emex Press or VC or one of this material. And uh, you will have to go through all the hydrofluoric acid etching and salination, of course. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, very, uh, very um, uh, informative question. And you have answered, the, I mean, quite uh, extensively to the question. And, and um, the next question, Dr. TC, is the good uh, from Lee. Uh, is bonding of glass ceramics on zirconia a concern for longevity of multi-layered zirconia prosthesis? Well, good question, really. Uh, if you're going to use, um, if you're going to use zirconia, if you're going to use zirconia, uh, very much a lot will depend on where you're using your zirconia. I, I would like not to use the cornea on my very anterior teeth, like the central or the lateral, if I have my way. If the tooth is not very discolored, uh, I would probably like to use something like Emax Press or Emax Cat, for example. But the cornea is a very easy material to fabricate by the lab in the event of uh, CAT CAM nowadays. Uh, so if you use anything like, say, on the first premolar or something along that line, or canine tooth or one of these implant crowns, and you think aesthetic is a problem, then you will have to get the lab to cut back and layer glass ceramic. So, uh, so far my experience have been very positive. I mean, uh, I have used uh, material like FMZ, for example, with layering of ceramics, uh, and I don't see any delamination of the glass ceramics. I think the science is a lot more predictable. Uh, the manufacturers understand a lot better now. Remember in the early years, I, I see where the, the question come from. The early part of it, there was a lot of chipping of this glass ceramic uh, uh, on layered onto zirconia. But that does not seem to be a problem because the uh, technician understand how to work with uniform layer of glass ceramic and not leave a lot of unsupported glass ceramics out there. All right. Okay. All right. I think uh, maybe we can take one more question. I've got quite a number more questions. Uh... Maybe, I don't know, it's up to you, maybe we... I can them. continue. If, uh, if uh, you guys can hold the uh, meeting room open, I'm all right. <laughs> okay, uh, will you etch and bond the two structure if you use Emacs or Zirconia? It's quite a straightforward question. Will I etch the two structure if I were to uh, cement uh, Emacs? Uh, I presume, of course, you are, we always use this thing interchangeably if we were talking about Emacs Press or Emacs Cat Crown or Zirconia Crown. It very much depends on the cement that I'm using. If I am using, some cements are interchangeable as far as adhesive is concerned, all right? And the modern adhesive that we're using now, like the universal adhesive, uh, do not need etching. Uh, the reason is this. If I cut down the tooth for a crown, I think the most part of the tooth is mostly in dentine. Would you agree? Mostly in dentine yeah. after you've reduced uh, uh, the, the outer enamel for, for space with the crown. So for dentine, I think the evidence is pretty good that we should not be putting a lot of acid etching on dentine. So if you do total etch, you may want to do that. So if you're not going to do etch on dentine, then you're using one of these universal bond is self-etching mechanism. So I will not specifically want to etch it. If I use a universal resin cement like Multilink N, for example, from Ivo Club Everden, Multilink N has its own primer uh, material in the primer A, primer B, that if you follow the instructions, you're supposed to mix that A and B uh, in one drop and one drop and you paint it onto the tooth. That itself act as a self-etching primer. So there's no phosphoric acid on the tooth. However, if I'm using uh, Emax, say, on a veneer preparation, then definitely I have to etch because the, the base part of my, my preparation substrate is enamel. 
if it's mostly enamel, then I would love to make sure what is the best enamel bond, phosphoric acid, all right? Then I will etch it. And if I'm going to use something like Verilink Aesthetic or Choice or, 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 or Nexus or one of these uh, veneer cement, then you choose your, your bonding uh, uh, material of choice, be it uh, Tetric N Bond Universal, be it uh, Bisco All Ceram, uh, um, I, I can't remember all the, all, all the names, but Universal Adhesive, like Scotch Bond Universal, and then you use your resin cement. So uh, to summarize that, 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 that little question by going around about way, depend on the cement system that you want to use. Cement okay. system will tell you how you whether whether what technique of etching you will do. Okay, all right. Uh, I think uh, I, I think we go back to the first person who asked the question just now. Uh, is Tana Lechmi from Kalingam? Mm -hmm. uh, no, she she answered for you actually. Uh, the question comes from somebody. I'm not sure which method do you use usually for posterior crowns. Sorry, which material? We usually use for posterior crowns. Posterior crown, okay. Uh, well, again, posterior crown depend on the indication because not all posterior crowns are similar. Uh, is it a crown on a natural tooth structure? Is it a crown on implant surface? Uh, is it a crown that is uh, regular in the preparation height that I have? Or is it a tooth that is very uh, short, for example? Or, or tooth that has subgingival margin. So there are very many factors to consider over here. But suffice to say, with the advent of uh, cat cam dentistry, and the fact that, uh, that if you're going to make a gold crown, the expense of uh, making all these uh, all gold crown is driving us more and more possibly into zirconia. And uh, this will be one of these highest strength zirconia. Uh, take your choice, it could be lava, uh, or, or, or for that matter, you can even use something like Lava Plus. Uh, it can be Zircon. It can be um, FMZ. All right, one of these uh, common uh, zirconia crowns that are popular out there. And then in that case, uh, there will be the material of choice. If it comes further forward, say to a posterior tooth like a, a premolar, the first premolar, if it's an aesthetic uh, situation. And if the load is not very heavy, then I would be tempted to say I use one of the newer translucent zirconia. I trade off on the uh, material strength, but in return, I get higher translucency approaching to one of the uh, uh, glass ceramics that you have. Uh, but you probably still have, you should, you should be bonding this uh, uh, zirconia crowns. For serial crown, by the way, if you're using one of the stronger zirconia, you could actually use conventional cement like uh, resin modified glass item. All right. Uh, but then I throw a spanner on you. If you have a tooth that is uh, very short and you are fearing that the crown will dislodge, uh, beyond the fact, of course, you can add uh, little uh, boxes and grooves to increase retention, then I'll probably want to max out and get as much retention from a bonded resin cement. Uh, like Multilink N or Panavia, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, your last your last statement also answered one of the questions. Short, short crown, uh, short clinical crown. Maybe we can take one last question, there, TC. Thank you. Uh, what material will you use? Will you recommend for an anterior Maryland bridge? What material would I use for anterior Maryland bridge? Um, if I have my way and the color is not an issue. It's still very predictable to use a porcelain fused to metal crown, to use a metal wing. Uh, we're referring to Ma uh, Maryland Bridge. Uh, we oftentimes have uh, one or two wings on the neighboring abutment teeth. So if the, the neighboring abutment teeth are not terribly translucent and you can get away with it, I feel very comfortable to use a porcelain fused to metal, a traditional crown type material, because I think the connector will be at its strongest. Uh, and then I will bond it with a universal resin cement like Panavia or Multilink N. If I have a color issue, then I will go into one of these Zirconia uh, uh, Maryland Bridge, all right? And uh, the Pontic will be a layered uh, glass, porcelain onto the zirconia substructure. But the wing behind is a monolithic tetragonal uh, opaque zirconia at its strongest. And again, I will bond it with my universal resin cement. 
uh, with due sand blasting or using of uh, Zerclean or Ivoclean and uh, making sure that I will prime my tooth surface of bonding. But this topic can go on forever, you know. Maryland Bridge, do you do a Maryland Bridge with one wing or two wings? Traditionally, some people even extend it as far as possible to neighboring teeth. But I think from experience and the, the, the data that we have out there, perhaps one wing works better than two wings, you know. You're looking at one wing only. So that has a big impact on retention as well. So it's an interesting question if you really want to answer it in depth. Thank you. All right. Thank you, TC. And thank you very much uh, for sharing your, your experience and knowledge with you know, all our participants. And tonight we have, at the peak, we have about 372. Thank you very much, bro. You work very hard to, uh, uh, because of the added numbers, because you normally yeah, no, don't no, see. I also check on our YouTube, there's about 20 uh, who has also view, 26 viewing from the YouTube. Very good. Thank you. Much appreciated. All right. Again, thank you very much again for sharing with us, and uh, we hope that uh, with your like, with your your what you have shared, maybe some 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 like some idea to our 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 colleagues who have joined us uh, tonight. Again, on behalf of our uh, XD uh, section fifteen, we'd like to thank you uh, for your effort in uh, making uh, the, the this session a fruitful one. And well, as I said, for many, we got, uh, I think this is the second highest number of um, uh, uh, participants who have uh, uh, logged in, not just registered, we have logged in our about two months, uh, uh, three months uh, program. Okay, thank you very much. Doc. Much uh, appreciated. I think before we end again, I'd like to give due credit and recognition to Professor Mohammad Ibrahim. Thank you very much for your sterling leadership in uh, making this uh, webinar go on. It's a tireless task to come in every week to uh, champion for it. Thank you very much, Prof. And I see familiar faces there for all the way from Pakistan, Professor Ashad Malik. Hello, you're looking very well, sir. And uh, well, yeah. I, at least I see on my screen, uh, old friends like Dr. Uh, Wan Leong, and of course, Dominic. Thank yeah. you all. And I hope uh, I have left some pulse of information that can set you thinking as to how you like to work with this new material of all ceramics that is uh, in our arena right now to pair it correctly uh, to resin cement. So it's just a clinical uh, lecture, hopefully uh, enlightening. I apologize if it, some parts of it look a little bit more commercial, but really you have to anchor it on brands because ultimately that's where we are at this juncture, a lot of branding. Right. Well, thank you everybody and uh, appreciate your attendance yeah, to tonight's you. lecture. And next, I guess on the next week we will have um, Dr. Uh, Professor Linda uh, from, uh, from uh, University of Indonesia, uh, Linda Watik, and she is currently, I think, the Dean of University of Indonesia. She will talk on oral hypofunction and orthodontic care for the older population. So again, I invite you to share with, to join us our next Wednesday, uh, 21st of October. And later we have our friends on the 30, 28th of October, Professor Arshad Malik will be talking about prevention of dry socket by understanding the latest concept of and its pathology. Thank you very much all and uh, have a good um, uh, session. We have a good session and see you again uh, next week. Thank you and good night. And thank you again to all my, our subcommittee, Amy and Mayuna, uh, for helping in making sure the program runs smoothly. All right? Thank you and good night. <laughs>